Hi, everyone. Yes, uh, my name is Jeff Mendoza. I'll introduce myself a little bit. Um, I work at Microsoft on open source compliance tooling, uh, the kind of things that make sure that um, all of our uh, open source, we are legally compliant and security compliant. Um, also, part of my day job is to work on clearly defined project, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. Uh, and so we're, I'm going to cover discovering your dependency license information and how clearly defined might be able to help you out with compliance. So first of all, what, you know, what is open source? What is the license? Uh, of course, the license is what makes open source open source. Uh, if you can see the code, but you can't modify it, you can't play with it, you can't redistribute it, it's not open source. Um, and therefore, if we, if we all really appreciate the freedoms that the licenses give us, uh, we should also appreciate and, um, and show our appreciation by obliging to the requirements that licenses um, require. Some, some examples of requirements that licenses have are attribution, uh, which means just say this is, I, I got this open source from so-and-so. Uh, retaining the copyright statement of the open source that you're re reusing, uh, potentially giving an offer for the source if you're distributing the binaries, and then uh, maybe making if you're making changes to the to the software, ma maintaining a change log or marking the changes that you made. Um, and depending on the obligations of the licenses, the particular license that your dependencies have, you may make choices on which. Um, which dependencies you decide to take on in your project. Um, and it may be choices that affect you. It may be choices that affect users of your code, your library, your tools. Uh, and then you'll have to make compliance actions based on those, those licenses and those uh, dependencies that you choose. So two steps to, to you know, figuring out what you're going to do. First is knowing your dependencies, which is uh, Sometimes, depending on, on the language, uh, a challenge. <laughs> and then knowing the license of your dependencies. Uh, and this is where Clearly Defined will help you out, uh, but I'll, I'll dive into that a little bit later. First, I want to cover, you know, you may, you may have a question, do licenses affect me? Um, let's say you're a library crate producer. Um, you just have a, a, a library, a tool, some useful uh, methods. You put it up on Crates.io. You don't do anything other than that. Well, you're not actually distributing your dependencies. Um, you're not even um, uh, using them locally. But the dependencies that you choose have an effect on the people that consume your crate. So let's say you want everybody to use your, your crate, but you have a dependency on something that maybe um, people don't want to use. So that might be a, a reason why you want to know the dependencies and the licenses of your dependencies. Um, so if you, if you produce tools, Again, you could just put, put your crate up on Crates.io um, and have people download it, but you might also want to distribute a binary of your tool. In that case, you're distributing also the the, um, all of your dependencies and then all of the clauses for um, things, that you, or things that are required when you distribute the code uh, take effect, and you have to comply with all those requirements. Um, maybe you have a web app that you write in Rust and you want to um, have people use uh, you put it up on Crates.io, or maybe you run it publicly. Well, now you have to comply with any network coffee left uh, obligations that those dependencies have. Um, or let's say you distribute a Docker image of your, your web app so that people can download it and run it very quick and easy. Well, now you're distributing all the dependencies that you have as well. OK, so jumping back to clearly defined, what is clearly defined? Uh, it's a project under the OSI, and it, it aims to be a central pool of knowledge of license information about open source software. Uh, license information usually accounts to about three things. The, um, the actual license, and um, there's, a, there's a format that's, uh, or a specification called SPDX that we use to uh, be, to, so that when you say MIT, you mean this exact version of MIT, not this other variation. Um, so that, that's the, the actual, first is the actual name of the license. The second thing is the um, uh, attribution, so, or the, uh, you know, the, the name of the person who, the, who owns the copyright, person or entity. And the third thing is the source location. So if you get um, some, some package managers, you can download the package, 
but it, there's no point there's no pointer to the actual source location like which github repository this package came from so clearly defined is a project to get all of that information in one central location um, and one of the things it does is when you when it when it downloads a source package instead of just looking um, in in the rust case instead of looking at the the declared license in the crates.toml, um, it actually runs scanners on everything inside, all the source code inside of the, the package. Um, because people don't always declare all of the licenses that are actually in the source code. So um, uh, it, it runs scanners on all of these packages, and then it shows you here's the declared licenses and here are the discovered licenses. Uh, and if those don't match up, then it actually gives it a lower score, saying that people, you know, there's not, there's actually licenses discovered that were not declared. Um, and then w another central point of the project is that running this scanning is actually ex pretty expensive, and there's no reason why anybody in the world has to run scan code, which is one of our scanners, on a particular package more than once, because that package with that hash is never changing. So once that scan is is run, it's better to just store the results in a in a public location, uh, rather than everybody having to try to run these scanners all the time. Um, and then the next major thing that comes in is, other than just storing the, the results of scanners, is, um, of course, scanners are not perfect. They're, they're programs, and you can make mistakes. It can't cover every single case where every single license um, can be discovered. So there's a community-based curations process in the clearly defined knowledge pool where uh, if a scanner says, hey, um, this, you know, I couldn't determine the license of this package, but somebody else can read it and say, hey, it's um, in a different wording, or for some reason we, we, you know, the scanner didn't pick it up, uh, a person can, or usually a lawyer, can say, hey, the, the, the license of this package is actually MIT, um, and then it can be peer-reviewed by other people in the community through the typical GitHub PR process. And everybody can kind of agree um, what the, the the whole community can agree what the license of a particular package is. Uh, and the end goal of the project is if if you do have problems with packages where declared versus discovered is wrong or curations are needed, um, the owners of those packages can actually go and fix their own package. And so that you know maybe maybe in the future this project won't be necessary because the declared license on all packages will just be very clearly defined. <laughs> um, so great, how do I use Clearly Defined? Uh, well, it's got a website. Uh, I was going to show it to you. Whoops. Right here. So you can go browse. And of course, um, Clearly Defined supports many different types. Uh, so here I'm looking at a few crates. And you can just go see here are some examples of the licenses that uh, are found for these particular crates. But I know you're thinking, hey, you know, I'm not going to go to a website and look up all these licenses. There must be a simpler way to use this. Um, so uh, I actually wrote some tooling to hit the API uh, and based on a create your, your, your Rust package to show you how easy it is to detect the, the, the dependencies you have and then query the licenses for those dependencies. So I'm going to cover that right now. Um, so the tooling's up on GitHub here. And the crate is here. So quickly, uh, what it is, is it looks at your cargo lock. And then it has a few different um, command line tools that takes the, the output of your cargo lock. And the first tool converts the, that output into a, a format that clearly defined can understand. And then the second tool, two tools, one will um, take that format and then query clearly defined for just the license information output in a CSV, something you might want to store as a, a uh, artifact with your build. And then the, the, um, the other tool, CD to notice, will take the output of that and create a notice file for you. And a notice file is, um, it, is something that will help you with when you're redistributing um, your dependencies. So the very most common requirement of obligation for licenses is that when you redistribute it, you provide the notice. And this is a, a completely automates that process for you. And I'm going to go ahead and show you an example of how it works. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, I'll show you in the, the code here first. So first, 
first thing it does is, like I was saying, it, shows you, it gives you the output of all my dependencies in a format that clearly defined and understands. And then here's the one that would um, go ahead and, and query clearly defined for the, each one of those packages and versions and gets you the license. So this is something you could run. Uh, the other one thing I want to show you is I have a, in, this, in, in um, my tool, I hooked it up to CircleCI. And then whenever I tag a, um, make a git tag, I have a, a workflow that's going to create a git release and um, attach the binaries of my tool. And of course, since I'm attaching the binaries of my tool to a git release, I'm making a distribution of all of my dependencies. So I want to generate a notice file and put that inside of my distribution. So part of, part of, the, um, part of the build process is the build of the tools. Part of it is the notice generation. And those get merged into the publish. Uh, I have it here. Right, so here's on the notice generation. I'm um, doing cargo install of my tool and then running the notice generation. And then on the publish, I'm just tarballing it and attaching it to my GitHub release. So here's the actual uh, tarball that I'm attaching to my GitHub release. It's the binaries of my tool and then the notice file. So I look at the notice file. I have the uh, I can I have, I'm correctly um, fulfilling all the requirements of my my dependencies uh, dependency license obligations. So for example, Cloud ABI, I have my copyright, and all of this information comes directly from Clearly Defined. So I know it's uh, been peer reviewed and it's been um, uh, detect all the, all the licenses have been detected. Mm -hmm. Uh, here's the crate. Okay. Okay. And um, this tooling, actually, I want to show you the source real quick. It's, it's very simple. Um, for example, I'll show you the... Uh, yeah, so it's it's only a few lines of code. Again, it's it's something that um, you don't really need these tools to do this if you didn't want to. So if you have if you're in an organization which already has a CI/CD system or a build process, uh, hitting the API and querying for things like notice or things like what is the license is something that is extremely easy to do. Um, the tool is just an example on how you can how you can do that. Uh, and how you can integrate it into, you know, in this example, Circle CI. Um, the REST API is is linked here. So we have uh, Swagger on. The main thing that you'd want to be doing is querying the definition uh, and the type provider namespace name revision. Uh, all the all the type provider namespace would be the same for all crates, and then the name revision would just be the name revision for for your particular crate. That's very simple. Uh, and then again, the, the notice file here will generate a, the notice for you automatically um, for if you give it the list of your, your dependencies. Um, so maybe you're thinking, hey, this is cool. Uh, how could I help? Uh, I think the first, if you take anything away from this talk, uh, it's not go use clearly defined. It's that um, you should respect the licenses of your dependencies, and, and, and by respecting them, you should comply with the obligations that they, they impose. Uh, and then secondly, if you, do, if you are interested in clearly defined, uh, take a look at the tool, take a look at the, the licenses of the crates that you know or that you use. Uh, if you see that an error on the website, curate your dependencies. So um, as I was mentioning, uh, if, there are, if there's an error, anybody can go submit a curation for it to be um, peer reviewed. So for example, I was looking at this. Uh, this package and it's discovered and a no assertion. So no assertion means that the tool found legal text, but it didn't actually know what the license was. And if you go look at the files, oh, I had found it before, but it's not here. I think it's, oh, here it is. You can go and click on the edit and type in uh, what you think it is and click submit and it'll open a GitHub PR to our curation repository with your um, curation. So another thing is, uh, if if you see that a um, 
a package is being de not being detected correctly. Uh, we're actually clearly defined as just running these underlying scanners. Um, one is scan code, one's phosology, licensee. Uh, so those scanners are not perfect, and they're, they're really great open source projects that could use contributions to help detect licenses. Um, so that would be a cool thing to do. Um, compute power, so we actually, like I was mentioning, the scanning process is expensive. So um, there's a whole big queue of, of requests for things to be harvested, and then there are machines that go and pull things off the queue and harvest stuff and, um, and submit the results back. Right now we have um, compute resources donated by Microsoft, Google, and Amazon. Um, and so any compute power donated to the project would be very much appreciated. And then the last one, which I'll go into a little bit more detail, is make your own crates clearly defined. <laughs> so how do I you know if your crate is clearly defined? So first thing to do is if, if you go to the website and you don't see your crate here, that means it hasn't been harvested yet. Um, and there's a, a web page. There's also an API to queue harvests. So you just pick, the, you pick crate, and then you type in the name. And that'll be queued to harvest. It might take a few hours to be harvested because it's a, it's a backlog of, of uh, tools being run. And then check, check the results of your harvest. Are there any no assertions? Are there any licenses detected that you didn't know you had? <laughs> are there any licenses detected that you think are wrong? Uh, and, and then submit the curations like I was showing you before. And then the main thing would be to go and actually fix your package. Say, um, uh, if, if there's a problem with the scanner, and it's because your license text has a typo, <laughs> go fix your typo. Um, yeah, and that's all I had. Uh, I'd open up to questions now. Thanks. Yes, in fact. Uh, so I've been working in a very small cluster uh, on similar problems. Yes. Um, do you, would you agree with the point that uh, this kind of, uh, let's say, license checking mechanism should be part of uh, whatever distribution means uh, are provided by every language right now? So um, I'm going to repeat the question. Uh, the question is, should the scanning or should the, the, the double check of is, is the declared license correct be a part of the package manager? Um, I would say that would be, yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy with um, cargo as it is, but that would be great, but there are a lot of other languages that are in a way worse space than this right now. Um, there are languages that, for example, um, when you have multiple licenses, it's very important whether or not it's an and or an or. Uh, for, but many, license, many package managers have um, uh, the licenses is just a string or, it's just a, or, or an array, and there's no way to detect that. Many package managers don't have a field for source location, and that's something that has to be detected. So um, there, was actually, there was actually a talk yesterday here at, in the dependency management, was, which was package managers, go fix your stuff. <laughs> um, and, and it had a lot of that kind of uh, a direction. So I don't know. I mean, that's a that's a good question, a good a good thought. But I, I think the fir in the first part, we just need to have the right um, metadata as maybe a requirement, uh, and have the right um, language as far as ands and ors and, and things like that around um, license type. Over here. Yeah, I have a question. When I'm a user of such an open source component, yes, uh, can I trigger a harvest? Yes. And and if there I find something that's not correct, what, what would I do? Would I just uh, uh, send something to uh, clearly find, or would mm -hmm. I contact the original author? Yeah, so the question was, uh, if I'm a user, if not just if I'm an owner, can I tr trigger harvests? And yes, absolutely. You can put, anybody can come over here and put whatever they want, or use the API to trigger harvests on whatever package they want. And then the, the second question is, what do I do when I find a, an error? Uh, and I would say, do both. Um, the, the, the first question was, should I, uh, should I make a curation, like what we were doing here, which would 
change the clearly defined knowledge base on what's, what's the information about this package and definitely do that. And the second question is, should I go and you know, open an issue or try to fix the, fix the bug in the uh, upstream package? And, and yes, absolutely. I mean, that's the goal is that packages don't need, don't need the scanning and don't need clearly defined in the future. A question in the back? Yeah. Yeah. So the question was, what? How does curation work? Uh, I don't have it here. So what happens is, is when you submit a curation, it opens a PR into this repo, curated data, and once the PR is merged, then clearly defined will go and. Um, merge that into the, the central database. Uh, and if you see, oh, this might be, we have some bots that do uh, curations too. Um, yeah, but anyways, you see there's, there's curations on lots of packages that come through here. Um, a lot of our lawyers curate packages because um, you know, we, we, we find issues and we don't see that the correct information there. Uh, but there's a curation community. Um, we have a, so a little bit more about the, the project. Um, if you go to if you go to docs and then get involved, um, you can see we have a Discord, and a lot of discussion happens there uh, between lawyers about hey this this legal um, situation is unclear how should we curate this, and we see a lot of community discussion. It's really great, really cool. Oh yeah, one more question. <laughs> oh, two. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I really like a, a lot of our compliance lawyers. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, I just had a question about the scanner. Does it support um, a package that has multiple licenses, which I guess would be the case if you had all of your dependencies memorized? Um, people use multiple licenses for different reasons. One is um, they put uh, a subcomponent, they just check it in via vendor, and they would have this piece is under this, li this license, and this piece is under that license, and the license would be an and. Uh, other people put multiple licenses uh, just f because they feel it like it, that usually is an or. They say, I, I would like my you to be able to use my package under this or that. It's up to your choice. Um, so, I'm going to repeat the question. The uh, uh, question is, what do we do about license conflicts? Um, clearly defined, the project doesn't really give you, you know, legal advice. It's mostly just trying to tell you what the licenses of the package is. Um, and, you, and then in that case, you know, we have to know, well, GPL can't be with uh, these other licenses that have different requirements because they, you, know, you can't add requirements to things that are linked with GPL, for example. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's not usually part of clearly defined, but if you have, again, if you have a system that's doing the detection and, 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 and needs the license information, you can get the license information clearly defined, and then you can write the rules based on the policies of your organization and your legal guidance. Yes? Um, <coughs> I'm doing some um, packaging for the end of Rust, correct? Cool. Um, and yeah, as you might assume, most of the work is uh, researching license information. Okay. Also, this um, project is clearly benefit for us. Okay. Um, is there any kind kind of um, track kind of uh, reasoning if the file is curated through the clearly defined um, system, um, where I can point to? to tell somebody um, who is interested in, is this really this license for this file? Hmm. How um, did you ev evaluate if it is? OK, yeah, so th transparency. the question is about the, the transparency of the curation process. So uh, uh, all the curations are PRs, and, and we, ha we do have the full Git repository history of all curations that have happened on that package. Um, and again, if, if, if you go to the site for a particular package, uh, down here, you can see the raw data, and of course, it's available over the API. 
The definition is the uh, merge of the harvested data and the curations. You can also directly query the curations and the harvested data that are the, is the output of the tools and see what, where, where you're getting what from. All right, and that's time's up, and thanks, thanks all again. I really appreciate coming here.